Hello and welcome What The Finances to another episode of the What The Finance podcast, where we talk talk to experts to help gain a greater understanding about what is happening in the world of finance, investing and markets. So on today's podcast, I'm happy to welcome Manoj Pradhan, who's the founder of Talking Heads Macroeconomics, an independent research firm and co-author of the bestseller, The Great Demographic Reversal, which I really enjoyed. I actually read it uh, over the summer and (laughs) it's one of the reasons I uh, invited you on. So Manoj, thanks for joining the podcast today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's um, something I've been looking forward to. Thanks. You're welcome. So uh, my first question, you know, when did you really start studying demographics? And I guess at what point did you understand that it's pretty important and it's going to have a big impact, not, you know, into the future? Well, to be honest, it's, it's, it's it's a very tricky point. Because most of the time, you don't really study demogra- uh, demography in, in, in university. It's not part of the textbooks. It's not part of the mainstream thinking. And 99% of the time when demography is spoken about, it's something that is so far out into the distant future that really things are not going to change. I think what piqued my interest is we started talking about demography um, as another reason to sustain this decline in interest rates that we've seen from the 1980s. And uh, both Charles and I were thinking, well, something here doesn't sound right. If demography was improving over the last three decades, which has been uh, coincident with inflation falling down, surely the reverse can't also be true. And then we started stress testing our hypothesis. This is when both of us were working at Morgan Stanley. Uh, and of course, as you can imagine, there was there was a lot of opposition to that, which only made us determined to see are we right? Are we along the right tracks? And the more we studied it and the more we looked at the global trend, the more convinced we got. So it, it was more a process of discovery um, uh, along the way rather than something that was a deeply embedded uh, hypothesis for decades or anything like that. It, in that sense, it's it's rather recent. Are you surprised by how little research there really was on, I guess, demography and the impacts it has? It was shocked is more the word. I mean, you know, we've got... We thought things like that would have happened. I mean, I I could understand that it hadn't been picked up by central banks because their forecasting and policy horizon is about two years. Um, And they have done work on demography, but it had mostly to do with pensions and pension benefits and and the like. But I was a bit surprised that um, the, the stories surrounding demography and inflation had not been linked. I, I mean, I understand at the one, um, on the one hand, it's a real variable. Uh, it's actually about quantities, and we link it to a nominal variable, which is inflation, which is in itself uh, a jump in thinking. But at the same time, it's impossible to think that something so dramatic happens and it doesn't have a profound change in the world that we live in. So yes, I, I was very, very surprised. And do you think that's the issue? Maybe the fact that it takes, you know, decades to actually have an impact on on what we're doing, whereas you know. You said the Fed Bank focused on two years. I guess most investors are short term as well. Do you think that's really the influence? It, it is, but you know, it's 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 a it's a bit like the sand very slowly slipping from under our feet. You know, you sit on the beach, and this is kind of a very slow motion variety of that. But I'll tell you two things that are really interesting as far as bringing that long term to today is concerned. The first one is this demography. The this demography uh, that we now face ahead of us started changing a decade ago. Right. It was in 2010 that the most influential economy of our times, which is China, you know, as we wrote in our book, and uh, thank you for reading that, by the way, uh, it, we really had no idea when exactly the change would materialize until the pandemic showed up. That gave us a, a, a very clear indication that things were happening very quickly. And the second thing I wanted I wanted to to talk about is it's a, it's a little bit like it's a little bit like uh, you know you're too young to have watched the movie Rocky as intently as I did. But <laughs> he used to the, in Rocky one, I think he was terribly out of shape, and he starts training, and he's got these ankle straps on, and he's running, and he's being forced to run, and then once you release them, he starts running a lot faster, right? So it, it's almost like inflation over the last three decade has these ankle weights around. And so no matter what happened in the cycle to, you know, inflation went up and then it was pulled down by the forces of demography. We don't need demography to really reverse in a solid way, even if the effect it had of pulling inflation down over the last three decades dissipates. That's a huge change because it suddenly releases inflation to do its own thing with a lot more freedom than it's had over the last three decades. I think it's a pretty profound change. Yeah, definitely. So would you say that's your sort of the main thesis that that you had, and I guess throughout the book was the fact that, 
you know, I, I'll paraphrase it. In 2000, China entered really the world economy through the, its uh, inauguration to sort of World Trade Organization by the US, and that basically doubled the amount of workforce available to the world. And I think Eastern Europe, Europe as well, during the collapse of the Berlin War, and that was very deflationary, if I'm not mistaken. No, I think that's that's absolutely right in a nutshell. I mean, you you added to an already benign demo, uh, demographic backdrop in the advanced economies where the baby boomers in the United States, for example, were joining the workforce. Um, and uh, so as these young people moved into the labor force, there were fewer dependents, young ones to take care of. Um, and a, a very big addition to the way you describe the book is now when the dependency ratio rises, it's because... You know, it would be one thing if the dependency ratio was rising because the number of young were being added into the population. That's okay because they're going to, they, whatever they consume as children might be inflationary, but they're going to go out there and then start working and add to the labor force later on. The problem with demography right now is it's depend, is that the dependency ratio is going to rise because of the elderly. And the elderly are not going to go back into the workforce and pay their way for the services they consume. They live a lot longer. And this is happening at a time when global growth is slowing down. And so these challenges become much, much, much harder to surmount. But you got it in a nutshell. That's the only little nugget I would add. Yeah, and I guess why is dependency, you know, having a high rate of dependency in countries, why is that inflationary? Well, there are there are two bits to the argument. The first is, why is a rising dependency ratio a much more serious problem than many people imagine? And then let's talk about the inflationary impact, right? So one of the things that actually Charles and I are very proud of is the chapter on dementia and caring that we've gotten there. Both of our families have really struggled uh, to provide adequate love and care for our loved ones who also have neurodegenerative diseases. And it's really, really hard. Now, what happens is, as the number of the elderly in our economy swells, the incidence of neurodegenerative disease in the economy is going to increase. Now, this is a very morbid topic, but it's not like um, the diseases we face today that kill you very early. Dementia allows you to live for a very long period of time, but it requires a lot of nurturing, a lot of care, and it's very, very, very labor intensive, exactly at the time that the labor force is shrinking. So, you know, if you're if you're keen enough to go into the UN population statistics, you'll see that the labor force is shrinking, so on and so forth. But what it doesn't tell you is that an increasing number of those workers is going to be channeled off into producing a consumption good, which is care for the elderly, which is not really leading to any economic improvement, right? It would be one thing if immigration was open in our societies and we could get uh, people with relatively low skill or the appropriate skill to look after the elderly. That's not happening either. So the impact that aging has on the current labor force is actually something that is not very well understood. And in that sense, we actually need more robots, not less. So it's not a substitute argument, it's a complementarity thing. Now from there, how does it lead to inflation? Well, um, there are two channels that we talk about in the book. One of them is incredibly intuitive, and the second one we're seeing unfold right in front of us. So the intuitive one is as follows, right? Let, let's say there are two people. You, you've got one person who's a dependent and one who's a worker. Now, the, the dependent does not work by definition, hence the, hence the word dependent, right? So he or she does not add anything in terms of supply to the table. There's just a given set of goods and services and this person consumes. He's a net demand creator or she's a net demand creator. And therefore, that person is inflationary. When you look at the worker, the worker is different in two ways. Number one, you know, 99.9% .9 of the world's workers are paid less than their marginal product, right? Otherwise, well, what's the point of hiring them? It would be loss-making, not profit-making. And then out of the wage that the person receives, he or she is going to save for the future. Yes, that can be credit surges, but by and large, you've got to have some savings to look after your future, right? Which means what you produce is far in excess as a worker of what you consume. And so the worker tends to be disinflationary, if not outright deflationary. Now, for the last 30 years, there were more workers creating uh, an improvement in the labor force than there were dependents. So the disinflationary impact was bigger than the inflationary impact of the dependents. Very simply, that story is going to turn around over the next three decades. It's the elderly and the dependents who will dominate the change. And hence, the inflationary impact of those guys is going to increase. The second one, which is very simple, that's a lot of debt. 
you know, what we've seen in the pandemic is the needs of the elderly cannot be ignored. They should not be ignored, but we've seen that they cannot be ignored, which means whatever care is required for the elderly is something that the state will have to participate in. Right? If you look at any debt statistics of the advanced economies, they're all going up. How do you finance it? You know, you'd love to grow, you'd love to have productivity. Both of those are very hard. And so inflation turns out to be a relatively simple quote unquote solution. It's what Milton Friedman called taxation without regulation. I mean, you know, that's the easiest way out. And I think we'll be forced to take that. Yeah, which is scary to think. So if we go back to I guess late seventies, early eighties, where you know, you mentioned there, I guess is where a lot of the baby baby boomers started to enter the workforce, so going from dependents to workers uh if we you know volker obviously the head of the federal reserve he was given a lot of credit for maybe getting inflation under control and the federal reserve was given credit as well do you think they're given too much credit for that and do you think it was more just the positive demographics that went towards you know influencing deflation in the economies i think they do deserve some credit right we can't say that they deserve no credit because he he really allowed the Fed funds rate to get to prohibitive levels. I mean, the positive, the real rates that we saw at that time, if they were here today, we'd be in a depression. The difference was at that time, they didn't have debt. So they could allow those interest rates to rise and really, really hurt the economy to bring about a recession. Today, that much is much harder, right? But uh, there is no doubt that demography helped. The reason demography helped is it's a very, the, the, this is one of the reasons that we try to be global. It's a very simple exercise that you can look at inflation falling across the world, regardless of whether there was a really credible central bank in, in place or not, regardless of whether inflation targeting was followed really well or not. And when it's such a broad spread global phenomenon, it's very difficult to think that the actions of one individual or one set of individuals should be given that much credit for such a strong and persistent disinflationary force. I think they should share it. I and mean, personally, I would say that half or more of the credit should be demography but you know we can quibble but the bottom line is there needs to be a shared first place on that podium yeah it makes sense so if we look at the countries now that maybe are going to really struggle into the future you know you mentioned probably countries with higher debt as well as poor demographics you know how are they is there a way for them to resolve that and i guess which countries are they um well, I mean, we, we, we always find a solution, right? It's, it's, just that, it's just that we'll have to look really hard and swallow some bitter pills along the way. It's not that, uh, it's not that the system necessarily has to collapse. The first thing I think we need to do is get people more focused on the issue. Um, and, and one of our great hopes has been that the book has allowed policymakers to think a little bit instead of an obscure thing like demography, two decades into the future, it's something that may be affecting us now. That's the one thing. If that story grips a little bit more, policymakers can start looking at some of the needs of the uh, of the elderly that will materialize in the next decade or two. If we can ease that uh, demand for consumption through an improvement in supply starting now, I think we've got some hope that the stress may not build up over a period of time. When it comes to debt, there are very few ways around it. Let's hope there's some kind of a massive technological uh, you know, breakthrough. There hasn't been one yet. But barring that, I think one of the things that is a blessing in disguise, though people haven't seen it yet, is actually quantitative easing. Um, QE is a very divisive story. And at the moment, central banks are very keenly focused on reducing the size of their balance sheets to try and take away the punch bowl, whatever we want to call it uh, in financial markets, right? However, if debt is largely rising or to a large extent rising because of the elderly, that's not something we can control because the the numbers around demography are you know fairly comfortable. People are fairly comfortable around those projections, which means it's difficult to see the biggest buyer of bonds walking away from buying bonds at a time when issuance of those bonds is going to double or triple over the next few decades. In other words, you have to get the central banks back towards buying bonds. The critical story is what do you do with those bonds? If like we've seen in Japan and then in China, they're used for non-productive purposes, they can be deflationary, right? They need not be inflationary. In this case, we think there's a greater chance of them being inflationary because it's direct spending that is going out into the economy. It's not just building infrastructure, which we don't know if there'll ever be any use for. This is people consuming on a regular basis. 
So the inflationary story does come in and central banks can then be a little bit more straightforward. Number one, they can accept that some inflation is out of their control. They're not going to be able to keep it at two and 1.5. Let's accept four. There's nothing wrong with 4% inflation as long as it doesn't jump from four to six to two. It doesn't become volatile. 4% inflation doesn't break the bank in a sense. The second thing is you can divide instruments. One of the wonderful things that has happened in the wake of the pandemic is that emerging market central banks have actually shown us the way. Central banks like South Africa, uh, Poland, uh, India, they were able to buy bonds. Indonesia bought bonds in the primary market and they were able to use policy rates, front end policy rates in order to control inflation and markets were okay with that. So we have a plethora of solutions ahead of us. There's just a mental roadblock to using some of them because we haven't seen the, the versatile nature of how these can be used. And so far we've just had crisis after crisis. This is not a, a dire condition that will occur at any given point in time. It's a constant threat that will remain in our face for a very long time. I think we'll come around to that solution. Yeah, that's really interesting. So I guess, uh, and I think it's a chapter in your book, you mentioned how uh, an argument to what you're saying about potential inflation is Japan. So Japan, yes. they have, have you know, let's uh, aging population, but they've had deflation for the past however many years. So maybe can you explain a bit more about, I guess, your arguments why that's happened and why it might not happen to other countries in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, I, actually, we, 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 we thought a lot about that in the first chapter we wrote, really, because if you don't have an answer for Japan, I mean, why are we wasting our time reading the rest of it, right? So it was the first chapter that we wrote. Uh, I can't tell you how many reports of Japan's trade ministry I've gone through. I mean, they're all cyclist style, career font typewritten reports from decades ago, but they were fantastically eliminating. And, you know, the, the story around Japan is intuitively as follows. Let's say you're driving along High Street, right? You're on embankment, right? And, and embankment's a nightmare to drive along as anyone knows. But suppose there's a traffic jam at 11 o'clock, but all the side streets moving up are relatively free. You know, you've got ways, you've got uh, all these other maps. They'll tell you just take the side streets and go. And you release the pressure in your economies, right? That's kind of what happened uh, in, in Japan. Japan had a demographic problem at home, but it saw that China was teeming with labor supply, right? And it was a huge market. And that's where those ministry reports tell us that Japanese firms used outbound FDI as a way of escaping this logjam. They, they knew that the side streets were open. So take the side streets, take the side streets, and they cleared the logjam along the way. The problem now is you're going to be an embankment at six o'clock. And good luck taking the side streets. That's what the issue is right now. Every advanced economy has the same problem. So where do you export to? I mean, yes, you could say India and Africa, and those countries will do fantastically well. But are they going to be able to recreate what China did? China did something that was in a very benign phase of this global long cycle, right? When everyone loved globalization, when demography was uh, improving. India and Africa are going to have to do it while demography is adverse and globalization is in reverse. It's a very, very tall order. I think that's the difference that we have today compared to where Japan was for the last few decades. Yeah. And what do you think will happen, I guess, for the countries who might not be able to provide the QE? So I guess maybe Europe, UK and US can provide that and can maybe help their economies. But I guess for the countries that can't do that, do you think they're going to struggle or What's your thoughts there? Yeah, they, they really will have to tighten their belts. Luckily, there seems to be some kind of a reasonable, I don't know if it's serendipitous or it's just the way the economy evolves. There's a reasonably serendipitous correlation between the countries that need QE and the countries that will be allowed to do QE. So North Asia, for example, no one will have a problem if China does QE. I mean, they were the first to kind of really push the boat in emerging markets. Korea has a large amount of credibility, Taiwan, Thailand, these central banks have a fair amount of credibility. In Eastern Europe, uh, you know, places like Poland have already done it. Um, the Czech National Bank had a peg uh, of its currency and implicitly was doing QE. Hungary, okay, might be a little bit harder, but uh, if they have slightly better policies, I think they may be able to get away with it. And the ones who will have a problem doing QE, and the first name that comes to mind is Brazil, where credibility is always in question, they don't really have to do it. Right. South Africa was allowed to do QE under very dire economic circumstances. Um, and, and, you know, there, there is a way out where markets realize that not doing QE 
is probably much worse than doing it. And they're willing to take some measures to allow uh, economy. If it looks like the right economic solution, and more importantly, it's executed the right way with a set amount of uh, restraints and constraints on the central bank, I think we've got much broader access to it. And like I said, importantly, the access is available in those countries where it's really needed. So there, 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 is, there is some hope. The only problem is no one's looking at it that way. Central banks simply are not focused on that structural horizon at all. Yeah, which is, um, as you said, we've got a. It would be really interesting because instability is a lot worse for you know we've we've seen what can happen when there's instability in countries, even if they're far away, it can have an impact on everyone as a world. So, yeah, it's very, very important. So let's say you know obviously we focus on markets and investing. In terms of your thoughts on the impact this this will have in markets, you know obviously unless there's some you know some amazing technology that comes along and 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 helps us, how do you see this impacting? I guess the economies and markets throughout the world. Do you think we could see you know maybe stagflation? or what's your opinions on on this? Well, I mean, stagflation is a structural nature of the beast. Um, it need not be 8 and 9 and 10% inflation. I think that'll be very hard to sustain. Um, but I think uh, you will get something like a persistent 4% inflation rate, which is, it's not uh, out of control, uh, but it's not low either. What happens around those times is if you've been used to an inflation rate of 1.5%, and spikes going up to two and a half or three, suddenly living with four with spikes of six is a very, very, very different ball game. So I, I think there'll be much more volatility in future markets because it'll be the wrong kind of an environment where if growth is stressed and inflation has risen, the stagflation story gets a lot worse. Um, the second thing that will happen is we'll really, really have to start looking for who is reacting the right way, quote unquote, the right way. And by that, I mean, are you improving the productivity, say in your firm or in your sector or in your country, and therefore providing a higher interest rate for good reasons? Or are you being forced to raise your interest rates because you're running the wrong kind of policies? So the separation between winners and losers, particularly at these critical junctures in the business cycle, could get a lot worse. Um, and the last thing I would argue is that in terms of asset allocation, that story will also have profound impact, right? Because uh, there was a lovely paper presented last year at Jackson Hole by Mian Straub and Sufi. Um, and, and they argued that as long as inequality is in place, um, real interest rates will remain low because the rich have pushed a lot of their savings into the bond market. And if they keep buying bonds, then, uh, you know, interest rates are going to remain low. Now, it was a great paper, but that part of the argument actually got me quite worried because in th th these guys are investors. You know, if the bond market follows even half or a third of what we are arguing, it's going to be a loss making. Uh, it's going to be a loss making story. Uh, no one's putting money into the bond market if if it's moving against you. Uh, and so the support that we've had for the last two or three decades, besides fundamentals, has also come from financial flows. If those financial flows reverse, then again volatility um, um, goes up a lot. And you get bouts of volatility beyond that. The last thing I would argue is that break-even inflation is actually done as a favor. Um, so break-even inflation is the difference between uh, the yields on nominal bonds, uh, you know, the normal bonds, and the ones that are inflation uh, index, right? And so they have those yields have fluctuated quite a lot, and that's a good way for people to hedge against inflation. So I think that's really been one silver lining in in the global economy that places that have inflation index bonds have allowed people to really hedge themselves to uh, a greater extent than most people would have would have believed. So again, there's a little bit of protection here, but the overall conditions that the market will face are not fantastic. Yeah. And I think um, in the book, you mentioned as well that there'll be, you know, if you look at the past 20 years, you could say, I guess, capitals had the benefit compared to labor, but because there's going to be a shortage of the labor, you know, more demand for these, you know, healthcare and these sort of industries, I think, did you say that there's probably going to be a shift towards, you know, more emphasis on labor and labor is going to benefit from this scenario? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing that unfold right now, right? I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons that we thought the pandemic would accelerate our structural story is because we had seen something similar happening in retail, right? If you, if you look at, uh, I was just at, um, on Oxford Street earlier meeting uh, someone for a coffee and, uh, the only retail shops that are surviving bang in front of Bond Street Station is now the super dry global flagship store that has opened up over there. 
those are the guys who can afford to take retail space for advertising reasons. Otherwise, you get American candy stores there, which are service-oriented shops, right? Retail doesn't have a place. And that's what we saw even with the labor market in the pandemic, that a lot of that slow-moving shortage in the labor supply was already happening, happening right now. And so this is definitely something that is an acceleration of a structural trend. And it's it's something that we're going to have to pay more and more attention to. It's here to stay. It might resolve itself over a period of time, but I can't see the labor supply improve, improving anything close to what we've seen in the last few decades. Yeah, I've talked to people, you know, who mentioned the UK in the 70s and 80s, and they said they could walk anywhere and get a job the next day, yep. whereas that's completely changed. But I guess you could say maybe we'll see something similar in, in the future like that. Um, you know, you mentioned before sort of North Africa, I guess a lot of Africa as well as India and how they're potentially going to benefit because uh, they've got positive demographics. I guess, why do you think that won't be enough to, I guess, resolve this like China was? Well, I mean, there, there are quite a few differences. One of them I had mentioned before, right? That China just had, I don't know if you want to call it good fortune, but they had the fortune of really opening up their economy at a time when the rest of the world was willing to accept globalization. They were willing to really push um, investments abroad. Uh, it was okay to lose jobs uh, at home as long as it was in the name of efficiency and globalization. Because like you said, most people could get a job walking around. You can do that today as well, but it's a very, very, very different story from what it was back then. I think what India and Africa will face now is a much more different proposition because of a few things. Number one, it doesn't have... Uh, they don't have the same capital structure uh, in terms of uh, human capital or in terms, more importantly, of administrative capital um, that China saw. China was able to really harness uh, those stories very efficiently. And number two, I think the bigger problem is when you look at Africa as a continent, it's got 50 countries. Um, and the coordination among those countries to make it work like China did, that seems incredibly difficult. So if we look at, I'm sure you've talked to a lot of people about, um, you know, demography and the impact it's going to have on the world. So what are the greatest misconceptions that you see people have about it? Well, I, I think the biggest one is possibly Japan again, right? Which is that um, if, if, if demography was to be a problem anywhere, it would have shown up in Japan. Um, I, I think that's a very difficult proposition to get behind because as I said, if it's one country that's got a particular problem, then you can resolve that problem by exporting it somehow or the other. But if the whole world has a problem at the same time, there's no way to hide. That's the first one. The second one, I think, is that uh, essentially central banks are on top of uh, inflation. I think uh, once they realize that they need to act a little bit further, they will act a little bit further. Um, I think as we discussed it over here, they may have some control. Of course, they have some control, but whether they can really get inflation under control and bring it back to target is a very debatable proposition. And the third one, which is probably the most worrisome, is still that demography is a problem for a decade from now. It's not something that's changing. I think people want to see the numbers swell so they know demography is a problem. What we're trying to impress upon people is, number one, Inflection points are a huge change. If they were pulling, you know, Rocky's ankles down and those weights have been taken off, that's a big change in itself. Uh, and number two, because of those stories, the inflection point tends to bring far greater surprises, which is exactly what we've seen now. Yeah. So would the, could your hypothesis change at all? Is there anything that could make you completely change what you're thinking and well, the first silver bullet actually is just a cure for dementia or robotics uh, or AI, um, just getting to a point where they can take care of the elderly fairly effectively and fairly quickly. And then we don't have to worry about uh, them, first of all, needing more people to look after them, number one. And number two, not being able to work. They may be able to work into their 80s. I mean, I keep telling Charles that he's actually the wrong person to write this book because he's a machine, you know, and he's fantastic. And he's in his 80s. And if half the world's population could behave that efficiently, we wouldn't have the book to write about. That's one thing. The second thing is you do get a much sharper crisis. You know, nothing seems to focus the mind of policymakers like a crisis, right? I mean, there's an old phrase, never let a crisis go to waste. If something like that happens and we take a completely different tack on how debt is financed, um, how, we look at, uh, how we look at immigration, how we look at uh, policies that affect the elderly, that could be something, but that's a pretty dire way to get to a good solution. 
we're hoping there can be a much easier solution um, in terms of really understanding the story a lot more, but we haven't seen anything to to date so far. Uh, yeah, we can, as you said, hopefully it's not something like, because, you know, we've seen what, what's happening with energy at the moment. I guess that's the crisis that we maybe need to continue forward. But yeah, it would be definitely a different beast if we were to do a, a demography. Um, so Manor, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. So I guess my last question is, what is uh, one message that you want people to take away from our interview and the book as well? Well, uh, the, the one thing I'd say is uh, this is a story for now. Um, we, we, we need to think about timelines that collapse. It may not happen tomorrow. We're already getting a taste of what the future is going to look like. Um, and if we don't take heed from it right now, uh, we're going to be very ill-prepared for the future. So plan your investment wisely, um, plan policies wisely, get behind policymakers who seem to be doing the right thing. Let's not look for short-termism because in the end, it's going to come back to bite us. Yeah, definitely. I'm <laughs> I'm not very hopeful, unfortunately, but hopefully things change and <laughs> and, and all those things will, will, will happen. But yeah, Manoj, thanks again. So if anyone wanted to find out more about your work, we mentioned your book, which is amazing. I'll definitely recommend people uh, reading it. And it, you know, I didn't find it too complex as well, which is good. I think you made it very accessible to lots of people. Uh, is there anything else, anywhere else people could find your work? Uh, well, uh, uh, my website's down right now, but if you look for Talking Heads Macro, you'll be able to find me. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get that working in short order. But, um, you know, thanks very much for this bit of exposure as well. I really appreciate it for the book. Yeah, no problem. I'll put that all in the description below. But yeah, thanks again for your time. Excellent. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you're notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading and finance. See you on the next show.